from 24 Hour News This is an Art Prize finale with special. Why these finalists? Live from the Art Prize Hub in downtown Grand Rapids. Good evening, everyone. I'm Susan Shaw. Welcome to part two of Why These Finalists. This is when we ask renowned art critics why they think that these pieces of arts made the final cut and quite frankly whether or not they deserve it tonight we'll be discussing the 3d and time-based finalists last night in part one we debated the finalists in the 2d and installation categories and our experts certainly didn't hold back. You can watch that at woodtv.com. Well, you have until Thursday night, by the way, at 11.59 to cast your vote for the public finalists. And then on Friday night, you can watch the Art Prize Awards live only here on Wood TV 8. That show starts at 7 o'clock. And just like last night, we invite you to get in on all of the fun here at the Art Prize Hub and get in on tonight's conversation on Twitter by using the hashtag ArtPrizeWTF. Let the discourse begin. The Art Prize 7 Final 20. This is Art Prize at its best. <laughs> I didn't want to show this one to my kids. Well, I wanted to love this piece. I didn't love this piece. <laughs> Why? Um, <laughs> it's a great question. Good evening and welcome to Critical Discourse, the home of Charge Conversation at Art Prize. My name is Todd Herring and tonight we will be digging and prodding and examining what is about 19 artist entries that became Art Prize 7 finalists. Is it their aesthetic, their message, their location, or just pure luck that garnered the attention of the voting public or an expert juror? Why did these 19 finalists make it into the second round at the world's largest art competition? As our expert panel attempts to answer that question, we look to you at home. Send us your answers using the hashtag ArtPrizeWTF or by uh, putting a comment on the ArtPrize Facebook page. All right, let's take a quick look at how we got where we are today. Let's go back almost two weeks to opening day when Art Prize 7 kicked off with 1,550 works of art eligible for the half million dollars in prizes. Five days later, the art experts, serving as this year's category jurors, narrowed the field down to 20 juried award finalists, eligible for one of four $12,500 category awards and the $200,000 juried grand prize. Alongside the know-it-all art experts, <laughs> you, the voting public, has also been hard at work casting hundreds of thousands of votes to determine the 20 artist entries deemed worthy of the equivalent public vote category awards and the $200,000 public vote grand prize. And this past Sunday, we announced the Art Prize 7 public vote final 20, and now we have 20 finalists chosen by expert jury, 20 chosen by public vote. One artist entry filled two of those finalist slots, the only entry making it onto both lists. And we'll be discussing tonight if it's everything it's cracked up to be. Did you, did you get that one, Kevin? <laughs> cracked oh, up? No. No. <laughs> Boo. That was, a, that was, Boo. A, that was cringeworthy. Hey, hey, come on now. You can look at the full list of all 39 finalists on ArtPrize.org, but tonight we'll be focusing our attention on the three-dimensional and time-based categories. The three-dimensional juried award is presented by Hayworth, and the time-based public vote award is presented by the DTE Energy Foundation. Joining me tonight, my co-host and moderator, is Art Prize Director of Exhibitions and resident translator for Art World jar Jargon. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Mr. Kevin Beist. <laughs> And now let's introduce tonight's panelists. Art experts here to help us answer WTF, or why these finalists. First up is an independent curator whose work at the Walker Arts Center in Minneapolis led to the visionary open field programming, inspired, yes, inspired by models of the commons, crowdsourcing, collective action, and new forms of socially engaged art practice. Open field included the international touring Internet Cat Video Festival, which actually made a stop at Art Prize 2012. Please welcome Sarah Schultz. Next, we have the co-founder of Burning Man, a nine-day festival in Nevada's Black Rock des Desert, where participants join in the effort to co-create Black Rock City, a temporary metropolis dedicated to art and community. Our panelists developed Burning Man's art department, including the infrastructure and logistics that make possible the large-scale artwork that Burning Man is renowned for. Please welcome Crimson Rose. <laughs> And 
And our last panelist is writer and owner of Winkleman Gallery, whose groundbreaking exhibitions have earned rave reviews from the New York Times, Art Forum, and the New Yorker. In addition to their Chelsea Gallery, Winkleman shows in the world's most prestigious art fairs and represents artists whose work has graced the Venice Biennale, the Art Institute in Chicago, and the Whitney Biennial. Please welcome Edward Winkleman. All right, the panelists have been touring Art Prize all day to see the 19 finalists we'll be discussing tonight. Once again, we invite you to join us on Twitter to share your thoughts, questions, hopes, desires, dreams using the hashtag ArtPrizeWTF. I'll be keeping time with this bell to make sure that we are on track. Kevin, don't taunt the bell. This is right. my bell. I will fight <clears> you for it. Um, all right, uh, it's a very powerful bell, so let's, uh, let's not argue. So let's kick things off with a three-dimensional category. Entries that occupy space and are intended to be viewed from multiple angles. Sculptures that are not site-specific belong in the 3D category. All right, first up is public vote three-dimensional finalist Maya 7624 by Sengwo Park, showing at the Kendall College of Art and Design of Ferris State University. The hanging sculpture is made entirely out of stainless steel wire mesh. Kevin and panel. Why this finalist? So this is a piece that's become a real crowd favorite there at Kendall. It's the only uh, piece in their exhibition that's on the, the public vote list. There's a few more that we'll talk about on the jury list. Um, obviously, it's got this you know, art prize-y thing happening that we see every year, which is a really cool optical effect. Um, does it go deeper than that? What did you guys think? It certainly needs light to illuminate it. And so there's a certain aspect of mystery that's involved in it. But I love the artist's technique with it. The fact that it's sort of floating in space is really, really quite lovely. And Sarah? whether the name Maya yeah. goes with a female figure or not, yeah. hard to say. Yeah, I mean, for all the years I've worked in a museum, I think that, you know, as we like to say, people like magic, right? Yeah. And this piece has a lot of magic to it. Um, and I think I like, I spent a lot of time looking at technically how it was put together, and that was very curious to me. I have to say, for a piece that's supposed to be about ephemerality and the fragility of life, the image maybe left me a little lackluster. It didn't really um, engage me just as a figure of a woman, and I don't know if that's because it was tied to the title or not, but it, it was... It, it, did it, it did its work in about 10 seconds for me. Yeah, yeah the fact that it was a, a, a portrait of a woman yes. sort of seemed completely beside the point to a degree. I was really focused on what the technique was. I asked somebody how he had done it, and the technique is amazing. I mean, it's a very competent. The technique was very cool. Very it's good it. drawing. Yeah. Uh, I wish that I was more interested in what that drawing was, what right. the subject was, right. and not so focused on just the yeah. technique. As if he could have gone further with it. Yeah. yeah. Sure. All right. All right. Uh, so any, the public chose this piece. Any idea why they did? Specifically, Sarah, you mentioned magic, crimson. I think, I think it was easy to take in for the audience. Great. Ed, last off. Uh, it's very lovely. I mean, it's easy to look at and like and wonder how it was done. And that's half the, you know, half the battle of making yeah. magic, I think. Easy on the eyes. It sure was. All right, moving along. We'll compare <laughs> and contrast <laughs> two finalists. One is a three-dimensional public vote finalist. The other is a three-dimensional jury pick chosen by our 3D jurist, Sarah Erst Green. Let's start with the, fu the public vote finalist entitled Seasons by Robin Prost, showing at the Amway Grand Plaza Hotel. It's a sculpture of a tree made of over 1,000 pieces of colorful material suspended on fluorocarbon lines. <laughs> Attached to a 10-foot high, 12-by-12-foot pergola. Robin Prost is a four-time Art Prize entrist, entrant, most notably winning the $5,000 seventh, seventh place prize in 2013. <laughs> Seasons will be compared to Relic by Tamara Kosinanovsky, showing at the Urban Institute for Contemporary Arts. The sculpture depicts a slaughterhouse scene the artist created by transforming clothing cannibalized from her own wardrobe into violent imagery of flayed flesh. And it was inspired by an ill-fated eBay purchase that led, the art led to the artist receiving a freshly killed pheasant in the mail. <laughs> this is a true story. Yeah, it's a true story. True story. Kevin, so, talk so all right, we, it's a, a bit of an odd pairing, but we paired these up because... Um, because there's, there's this sort of um, thread connecting them, um, pun intended, that, um, <laughs> sorry. We're but good. That, uh, We're good. There's, Don't apologize. They're, they're, you, oh, yes, good. thank you. Hey, come on now. The both of these were, sorry, we got a public, we have a public well, a pick, a juror pick. They're both using um, these sort of unconventional art materials, um, you know, bamboo, thread, um, Christmas ornaments. 
uh, to create a tree. And they're, they're sort of using unnatural things to create a natural um, thing. And then also, of course, this, the fabric made to look so much like meat. Um, I, I, what, what do you guys think? Uh, is, is one of them pulling that off better than the other? Well, it's a strange pairing. I mean, certainly, I, I feel like season doesn't go far enough where the wonderful work with the fabric and, you know, the, the pictures in the brochure don't really do it justice so that when you actually come face to face with it, right. it can appear shocking, but it's the work, the craftsmanship is amazing, totally amazing. You, you, you said seasons didn't go far enough. Expand on that a little bit. I, I actually wanted to walk into it <laughs> and really right. sort of explore the environment. It sort of held itself back. Yeah. I, I, I mean, I'm staying in that hotel and I've, I walk by seasons every day and, and my feelings about it have sort of waxed and waned over the, the course of the last few days. And I see why the public picked it. It's shiny and people like shiny things. <laughs> um, I like shiny things, and, um, it, and, but I don't think it went far enough. I think it needed to be more dense. I think it needed more. More is more for that piece. Um, I think particularly in the environment of the hotel, I think it didn't need the title, and I can't get that song out of my head, like seasons, whoa, something, <laughs> something like that. But, um, but w w what about the materials in the piece? Because it, you, can, you can't walk into it, but you can get pretty close. And we know these materials. These are just sort of like Christmas ornaments that you can get at Hobby Lobby in a giant box. Well, this in is there. where Relic really succeeded right. for me more. Yeah. So the choices that right. Relic made were yes. very inventive. I mean, every time you would see, oh my, that's something that looks like that uh, flesh or feather or something. Mm -hmm. And then you saw that the extra layer there was that these were the artist's personal belongings or clothing. And mm -hmm. so there was a little bit of autobiography woven into there as well. Yeah. And you didn't have those layerings in season, at least I didn't see them. I mean, yeah. inventive and fun, mm -hmm. uh, shiny as you say, but uh, it didn't go that extra mile in terms of being really fascinating about yeah. the artist's choices. Yeah. How, how much of the, so with, with Relic, how much of the success of that do you think is dependent on that, the site where it's installed? It's in a very unique gallery with, um, with concrete walls and, well, and, we're, and we're, how things are high hung ceiling on books and, yeah. and things and actually, yeah. uh, you know, really takes up the space and everything, mm -hmm. that it's actually utilizing the space. It's high above you. It's on the wall. And it, visceral is what the word that keeps coming, even though yeah. it's cloth. Yeah. You know. I, I never thought of it before. But when I walked in there today, I thought, you know, this gallery does look like a meat locker a little <laughs> bit. <laughs> like it's sort of this white cube with a cement floor. Um, any other thoughts on these before we move on? I think Relic was an amazing piece. Yeah, yeah it works. I mean, I really think the way that she, tran the way that the transfiguration mm -hmm. of the material, and sometimes you could see the sock and you could actually see it, and then to have that sort of juxtaposed with this raw meat and the dead birds in a way was really kind of remarkable. Yeah. In a way it reveals she really knew the anatomy of what yeah, she was working absolutely. on as well. I mean, yeah. there, there was like some serious thought in yeah. each of those choices. So. All right, yes, indeed, remarkable. Uh, carcasses. <laughs> All right. Um, our next finalist is a juror selection called The Last Supper by Julie Green, showing at Kendall College of Art and Design. The work includes 600 uh, secondhand ceramic plates featuring cobalt blue paintings of death row inmates' last meal requests. The plates function as anonymous portraits that, when grouped together, suggest a memorial to life lost on a mass scale. Kevin. A very somber piece, um, obviously. It, it it's, it takes up quite a lot of space in that gallery. What, what were your thoughts walking in and going from sort of the, the wide view of you're seeing an entire you know, room full of salon style plates to the um, individual readings of these things? Take, take me through that, your, your first response to that, Ed. Um, well, it speaks first of all to how many people the states of the United States are executing and the, you know, the, if you're politically opposed to that, that sort of jumps out at you. What really struck me though was how many of these pieces, even though it was a very heavy topic, had humor woven into them. And yeah. I'm a big believer that you don't see the truth unless you see the funny side of things as well. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So um, we each had different favorites, but we almost always selected something that had some funny or humor woven into it. and so. Uh, that's kind of what jumped out at me. It's like, this is the last moment of somebody's life, and yet there's something really almost tragic comedy or yeah. com comedic about it. So. Right, about some of those food choices. Yeah, definitely. Incredibly powerful to walk into the room. The color choices, the, um, the plates that they were using, um, just very almost sad. But yes, there was that humor that um, 
What people actually wanted as their last meal, what was the one, the vending machine? They wanted to be eating right. food out of a vending right. machine. Or the spaghetti. Family. I think we talked about the SpaghettiOs piece. Yes. Right. They got Ple the right. Please tell yeah. the press that um, they only gave me spaghetti, not SpaghettiOs. So or I asked for SpaghettiOs. Tell, please tell the media that I asked for SpaghettiOs, but I only got spaghetti. Right. Mm. And which is funny and painful and, and sad tragic and, and tragic, it, right? Yes. And it's spaghettios, so, and that's that's your last that, yeah. meal. And and I, I thought this, I thought one of the the successful things about this work is that the sum of all of the pieces was so breathtaking, and yet each individual work also held you. And I think that that's a that's a skill that a lot of artists don't necessarily have. Yeah. And I think that really um, was was great. Very good. Great cool. thoughts on a very powerful piece. Once again, we're now going to compare two three-dimensional finalists, one selected by public vote, the other by Sarah Erist Green, the 3D category juror. The public's pick is Rolling Down by the Cruzy Crew, showing at the Amway Grand Plaza Hotel. Inspired by the words of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., the 24-foot waterfall is created out of seven different woods that begin the downward cascade separately, but begin to mix together as they crash against the face of the falls and finally flow out into a smooth, intermingled stream. Rolling Down will be compared to Uplift, a 3D juried pick by Jared Beck showing at Calder Plaza. The work was created from layers of discarded conveyor belts used to move mining material, uh, in mining operations. The massive and weighty belts are propped up on one side by a wooden frame. Kevin, waterfalls and conveyor belts. Sounds more like a song by Woody Guthrie. <laughs> what is it about these finalists that uh, made you pair them together? Uh, I paired them together just because I think that um, uh, th there's an interesting sort of material use happening here. So starting with uplift, uh, you know, you have this this wood wood laminate material, and they even um, they have this little display there that you can actually touch it and sort of see what these loops are made of, so that you don't mm -hmm. you know obviously touch the actual work. Um, and and the the piece seems very sincere, but it's using these. Um, these materials that are meant to sort of mask the true nature of something. It's like, this is what you put on a table to pretend you have a wooden table. Um, and then the, what looks like stone carvings are, of course, um, styrofoam. Um, t talk about this ma materials with this one, guys. Can we react to that? I mean, they're both dealing with flowing motion. Yeah. You know. Yeah. Um, I'm Sometimes something large doesn't make it better, necessarily. <laughs> right. I mean, I, and, th and that's coming I, from Burning Man. I, and that's coming from Burning Man, yeah. I mean, I love, yeah. I love the texture of the wood. The st I mean, it was just beautiful, the curls and everything. And, but yeah. Uh, um, Sarah, Sarah, you're yeah, shaking your head. Do you I ever say, say that when they're building the man, Crimson? Uh, <laughs> it's been a little bit. I have to say, this one for me really was, you know, WTF, WTF. Yeah. I couldn't... I, what I'd like to know is really um, to ask the public why they voted for it. I really want to know what, why people voted for it. And that's not to discount the work or the artist, but I couldn't, I don't know if it's because it was in a hotel and there are a lot of people going through, but there's just something about this work compared to all of the other works that you could have voted for in this category that just left me confused. Um, it just, it was, it was confusing to me. <laughs> Right. And, that's, right. and we haven't even gotten into like how and how it, Dr. King could even be a part of that. In a, yeah. Well, the audience cool seems to agree with way. us <laughs> right, on, right. for the most part. I mean, honestly, I looked at it and I thought this looks like a repurposed prop from an Indiana Jones movie. <laughs> I mean, okay. I'm sorry, yeah, but it really yeah, did absolutely. it. Which, unfortunately, I know yeah. that's cruel, yeah. but it overshadowed what I think were some sincere yeah. themes and ideas, sure. and sort the, of woven. And the message that they were actually trying sure. to Sure, it was just aesthetically the wrong right. match. Yes. Do you think the artist is more proud of the craftsmanship than the message? I think some, uh, sometimes mm. they get really focused on that and it doesn't go beyond that where um, the it's recycled material was just so luscious and yeah, let's, moving. Yeah, and you're talking about uplift. Let's talk right, about that a little yeah, bit. Right, um, yeah. It's on Calder Plaza, which obviously it's competing with um, a giant uh, mm -hmm. public artwork. Yes. Do, uh, you know, does it hold its own against it looks oh, like yeah. it's alive, old Alex it's Calder? It's like the ocean, and even though it's static, it's just, it's got so much motion mm -hmm. and energy. Yeah. What's strange is when you go behind it and see how it's propped up, it, now, propping up, I'm sure they did that so it wouldn't fall over, but it 
didn't seem like it related somehow. Yeah. That they were only trying to do it like one side. Yeah, and we don't have an image of that, but there's sort of a wooden armature on the yeah. back of it, right? Yeah. Which we all agreed was a bit of a distraction yeah. because we love the piece. It looked really solid. And then yeah. you walked around the back and you're kind of like, well, three-dimensional pieces, you should be able to see them from yes. any angle and yeah. still get the same yeah. sort of, you know, idea. Yeah. Yeah. So, all right. yeah. Bravo, bravo. More cheers for that. Uh, any last support. thoughts on that one? Yeah, no, that's, we're, I think we're good. Yeah. All right, moving right along, we got uh, two more up. Uh, two finalists, The Race is a 3D public vote finalist by Kurt Swanson, showing at DeVos Place Convention Center. The race consists of three bicycles made completely out of oak, ash, mahogany, aspen, maple, and bamboo wood that was stained, carved, shaped, steamed, and bent. Sounds like a lot of work. The bikes are posed in front of a 1970s photo of the artist. In contrast to the race, we'll look at Anishna Bensong Bimskaweb Shikigawag. That's more yes. easily pronounced as native kids ride bikes. The Dylan Miner piece showing at the Grand Rapids Art Museum. The, sculptures, the sculpture is an ongoing project in which the artist collaborates with urban native youth in an attempt to connect contemporary youth culture with traditional stories, art making, and indigenous knowledge. Kevin. Two sets of tricked out bikes. Yeah, so this, this pairing sort of made itself. Um, yeah. But obviously, like, you know, beyond the, you know, banana seat bike, uh, you know, kind of weird parallel that we get here, um, these, these two projects were made in very different ways. So talk, about, talk a bit about production, the difference between sort of carving alone in a workshop for hours on end versus uh, collaborating, finding kids and finding sort of uh, bike mechanics to work on these things with. Well, we were talking a little bit about the uh, parallels between that project and Rollins and KOS and yeah. somebody else who works with children. Um, and the, the thing that jumped out at me was that, that there were no real indications of the children's hands in these pieces. Uh, yeah. I mean, I love the idea, but no kid I know could decorate their bike that beautifully, that pristinely. Right. And so I wanted to see either a video of the artist collaborating with children or some sign that the kids were involved in making these. Yeah, so. I mean, it's very powerful, but I wanted to see more. I wanted to almost see the, the bikes obscure, that, that right. the culture is just really, really just oozing out of it. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to see them in motion. I really <laughs> wanted seeing kids actually riding them around and maybe doing tricks, yeah. things like that. I mean, as someone, I'm familiar with this project um, and this artist, and I do think it, this was for me more an installation problem. This was a curatorial problem rather than the objects themselves. It became so much about the object when what was everything around the object <laughs> that led to it. And I also think what's really interesting for me is that in thinking about bikes, bikes, because we suspected you were going to do bike bike yes yes um, is that you know bikes in both instances are about this notion of liberation and freedom and movement and in one instance you're really trying to take what we might perceive as native culture and really talk about urban native culture and not something that's static or in the past but something that's dynamic in the present and I liked that and I loved the wooden bikes I thought they were beautiful objects but it, for me it became more nostalgic than it did forward-looking and that that's just a comparison it, I don't it's not that I like one I think one is better art than the other I think they're so different and mm -hmm. the wood is just is beautiful and they're beautiful, beautiful they're beautiful objects yeah. mm -hmm. yeah. do you feel the photograph helped or hurt the bikes it helped me actually I, I like the wooden bikes better even though conceptually I like the other bikes I thought you know they're exquisitely well done and there was something about the installation and definitely the photograph in the back that helped sort of pin it all together. To, you know, a kid, a bike is about freedom. It's about adventure. And I think the wooden bicycles captured that better than the other bikes did. Hmm. All right. Adventure and freedom on Critical Discourse. <laughs> all right, up next, uh, you guys aren't making me ring the bell at all. This is good. We're, we're staying right on track. Up next is Mimesis, a three-dimensional juried pick by Kunihiro Ak Akinaga, showing at Frederick Meyer Gardens and Sculpture Park. It's a stoneware skeleton featuring decorative elements the artist creates by hand. Kevin, like you and I, Mimesis is beautiful, delicate, and fragile. <laughs> it is. <laughs> but it has thorns. It has thorns, Todd. Tell us why, this finalist. Um, yeah, so uh, this is, uh, just to give a bit of context, um, Frederick Meyer Gardens and Sculpture Park this year, their art prize show is 25 contemporary ceramic Japanese artists. So it's very specific and it sort of you know, ties in with the launch of their Japanese garden this year. Um, you know, really an exquisite show and, and kind of more focused than we see in most art prize exhibitions. Um, how do you think this piece uh, fit within that um, exhibition? 
<laughs> it, it's a bit of an oddball, right? I mean, most of the other objects it's, on view are vessels. And, and yeah. you really have, I mean, I think with everything at ArtPrize, you really have to be, uh, you have to take it in, you have to be there. You really need to, it's beautifully crafted. It's just stunning. Yeah. But I kept thinking, is it, you know, uh, an answer to Godzilla and, you know, coming out of the sea or something. I wanted yeah. to see it bigger. I wanted, to, and I actually wanted to see it walk across the floor. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> well, we were talking about the, the context of this piece because it was on the same sort of plinth with the same sort of uh, plexiglass shell over it. Mm -hmm. It looked like it could have been part of that show very, very easily. Yeah. Right. And we were wondering if you took it out and you put it in the Amway or you put it somewhere else where there was so much more going on and the lights weren't so dim, how yeah. it would feel and what right. audience response would, would be. It might actually dwarf it. You might not yeah. even notice it if it was exactly. in a different location. Yeah. So, yeah. But it is exquisite. I mean, yeah. it's really beautifully made. Yeah. So, Sarah, you're, you're Well, you're I just, it? all of a sudden I had an art prize question, which is, does this artist know they're in art prize? Uh, yeah, no, okay. they, no, they so do. They, so oh, yeah, yeah, so yeah, yeah. We told them. We so, told right. them. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. well, we don't keep was, them in the dark. It was such a very specific exhibition. Yeah. It is. Right? And so we're a thematic exhibition yeah. as opposed to some of the other ones that are that are more of a potpourri, as it were, yeah. thing. So, so it was a little confusing for me. But it was, I mean, it was a beautiful, they, it was a beautiful, weird, scary, lovely, delicate Yeah, and I don't, I don't know if this artist object. in particular was, but they, um, a number of these artists were... Um, in town for the, the opening of oh, the exhibition. Great. Very good. Our last finalist in the 3D category was selected by public vote. Greatest Generation, Beta Team November by Fred Coglow, showing at the Gerald R. Ford Presidential Museum. It's a high mezzo relief carved from a four inch base slab of butternut wood and features a Belgian equine and two best friends. <laughs> Kevin, why <laughs> the final line? <laughs> Did you look that up yourself? I did, you sure figure, did. did you figure it out? I sure did. Were you Googling That's, uh, horse breeds I, before the show? That, it was right there in the artist's statement. I'm oh, proud of the fact they prefer okay, so, the Belgian um, wines. You guys looked at a lot of woodworking today. How, do, how does this stack up? Uh, Fred can carve. I mean, yeah. <laughs> and he can talk about the work. I mean, he was one of the artists who was there talking about the work. Yeah. So I really appreciated him talking about the work yeah. because he knew exactly what he was doing and why he was doing it. Yep. And he's very good at talking about it. And he had all the answers kind of right there. And they were very accessible answers. Uh, I think the piece is also very accessible. Uh, I like that about it. It's, you know, it's incredibly well done. So. Very skillful, you know, yeah. phenomenal. I mean, what is when you start carving away? It's just like stone. It's it's not forgiving. Once you've cut away, it's gone. So the thought that has to really go into something like this when you're carving is, and it actually has a little bit of humor with the with the two older gentlemen as well. Mm -hmm. Well done. Uh, I was a bit of a convert before before I met Fred today. <laughs> I. I, I I had I groaned a little in the in the car on the way over, but um, I think meeting Fred and realizing just how complicated it is to to make something that intricate and how well done it is, and really the the degree that there's specific rules in this kind of um, this kind of carving in order to to trick literally trick the viewer's eye about perspective and everything yeah. and 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 really he the big advantage of that piece was him i yeah. think they're really talking about it and i think without the context of the artist and all of that stuff around the craft yeah it it would have lost me right. but but i get it yeah. So, Ed, as a gallerist, would you ever have the artist next to the work to help sell the piece? Uh, <laughs> are we talking about my artist, or uh, I mean, I all think three of you, just to in general, do you, uh, do you oh, recommend that? No, 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 Seriously, no, 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 felt like you felt transitioned after after meeting the artist. You had yep. a different impression of the artwork. So. Something powerful is going on. A yeah. serious answer to that, honestly, we have that opportunity at art fairs where artists will sometimes come and we yes. work out in advance a signal. It's like if it's going well, I'll keep you there. If I give you the signal, you should go. <laughs> All right, so, with that, the that's signal great. to go. That's great. That's the 3D category. Uh, we're going to have to take a quick break and then dig into the time based finalists. Sue, over to you. All right, Todd, thank you. The conversation continues right after the break. We only have one category less left coming up right after this break we'll talk about the time-based finalists stay right there well hey there and
welcome back to Critical Discourse, Why These Finalists. Kevin and our panel has reviewed the three-dimensional finalists, and we're now turning our attention to the time-based category. The time-based category includes works that are durational and change over time. The viewer has to spend some time with the work to fully view it. This includes performance, video, film, dance, music, and interactive work. The time-based category jury finalists were selected by juror Sherry Freelo. Please share your thoughts and help to answer the question of why these finalists by joining the conversation using the hashtag ArtPrizeWTF or by commenting to the Why These Finalists post on the ArtPrize Facebook page. First up, we'll look at two smashing finalists. <clears throat> that didn't work well. It's, it's about breaking things. For, uh, yeah, there we go. Fair enough, I deserve that. First is Breakthrough by the Breakthrough team showing at DeVos Place Convention Center. The work includes a large-scale mural created with broken, large-scale mosaic, sorry, created with broken ceramic plates. The mosaic is installed on the side of a shipping container-sized box in which participants can write personal notes on plates and smash them against a reinforced wall. We'll be looking at Breakthrough alongside Whisper. By, by Emily, Ke Emily Kennerk, showing at 250 Monroe. Kennerk's work is the only Art Prize 7 entry, earning a spot on both the public vote and juried award shortlists. Whisper is a... Th That's right. Quite, quite an achievement. Whisper is a 30-foot voice-activated table setting, a table setting activated by softly whispering into a microphone. The voice is expressed by startling vibrations, causing the dishes and flatware to eventually go crashing to the floor. Kevin and panel, smashing plates, painted plates, dinnerware, and how we relate to it. Tell us, <laughs> why these finalists? Yeah, so this is another natural pairing where you have, um, you know, uh, two time-based pieces, two interactive works. Um, both involve breaking plates in different ways with the interaction of um, of the audience. Um, let's start with Whisper. What did you guys, th what did you guys think? What was, what was the scene like as you, as you entered the room there today? A uh, lot of noise. <laughs> it was really delightful because the audience was able to actually participate. Their voice was able to move something as, the, or as Emily was talking about. And to me, this was very powerful. I kept waiting for things to fall off the table. She actually said that some people would come in and sort of push the place yes. away from mm -hmm. the edge of the table. Yeah. It's a very unique yeah. form of art vandalism that yeah. we're dealing with this year, that somebody is saving <laughs> it's, it it's from being reverse, broken and they're um, ruining the piece. Um, it's reverse art it's, vandalism. Yeah, reverse. Yeah. 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 Uh, I, I love this piece. I went to see it um, when I came here, and I was one of only two people in the space at the time, and did it, and had an amazing experience, and then we went today, and it was packed. It's packed. There's a line of people. There were kids. Um, all lined up to do this, anxiously trying to do it right, waiting to see if a work would fall. There was a very festive environment. Mm -hmm. and. And I produce a lot of participatory work. And for me, this piece hits every checkpoint, which mm -hmm. is it's wonderful if you do it if you're there by yourself. It's great if there are a lot of people. It, um, it's great to do. And you can, ha you can see this impact. It's also really fun to watch other people do it. And that is a real ha hallmark of good participatory work. Mm -hmm. So this, this for me was like, you know, hit every box. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Ed, anything to add about uh, Whisper? Well, I was just going to say, I also thought that the, uh, Whisper illustrated the potential of Art Prize better than anything else I saw, not only because mm -hmm. it's on both uh, final you know, lists, but also for the reasons that you, know, you could go in and this piece was conceptually resolved. It was really, really solid, mm -hmm. and yet the audience was loving it. Mm -hmm. So you could approach it on many different layers yeah. and, uh, you, and come away thinking it was a real winner. So. Let's talk about breakthrough quickly. Um, I know there's only certain times where folks are invited in to, uh, to smash a plate. I did it. I had to sign a waiver. It was um, quite a process. Um, and you can write a thing and smash a, a plate on a wall. Uh, but there's this mosaic that's always there as well. Um, any thoughts on how, on how this one is working as a participatory uh, plate breaking project. Sarah, it's, does it does it meet I your rubric? I uh. didn't have a breakthrough with breakthrough. <laughs> Sorry, I didn't. Uh, you know, and I think in part we were hampered because we actually weren't there when they were doing the, right. the breaking of the of the plates, which is a problem for a work that's essentially about participation. I think the other challenge I had is that the mosaic there alone was just a mosaic. Right. It, I didn't I didn't I didn't have any sense of 
you know, the, what, the catharsis that people went through or anything. It just looked like a mosaic, maybe with some shards where someone had written something on the back. And I do think it would have been even more interesting as a piece if you could, if you broke the piece there and then mm -hmm. the stuff that you broke then was transformed into a work there, not that it went into a box and then somewhere, yes. somewhere in another yes. place it yes. would happen and you're divorced from yes. that as yes. a participant. Yes. 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 So. It was like leaving me empty because I really, I not only did I want to smash it, but I, if, if taking it one step further where you're actually creating art right then with what the public is actually smashing. Would right. be, would complete it. Very yeah. good. All right. Uh, so the desire to smash something. If somebody would like to smash the bell, this is our last why these finalists of uh, Bird Prize 7, you can go ahead and smash that later. Uh, is you this will a have class? To sign. Is this the thing? We, could, is, we yeah. could drop it at the you end. You will have to sign a waiver, though. All right. Smash. <laughs> Smash my bell. Okay, here we go. Uh, up next is juried pick entitled Higher Ground by Kate Gilmore. Showing at Sight Lab's Rumsey Street project, the work is staged in, the, in a former convent. The exterior painted cotton candy pink while lipstick red dons every interior surface. Inside, as many as nine women in long white dresses and red shoes perform on swings mounted from the ceiling in front of open windows. Kevin, I tried to swing, but uh, I was turned away. I guess they did not like my dress. I'm not sure what it was, but uh, was it was it wasn't white enough. Anyhow, tell us um, why is this a finalist? Yeah. So, all right, this is uh, you know, Sight Lab is a um, really ambitious project this year. They've they've been able to give um, a number of artists their own building, and and one of them is is Kate Gilmore, who um, is a, a pretty well known uh, performance and, and video artist. Um, tell me your thoughts seeing this perform today. <laughs> it was delightful. I mean, you know, the the colors and. Not being able to see the women all the time, seeing just their feet, you know, it was just, it was delightful. The pink, the colors. Now, as I understand, you know, daytime looks different than nighttime, and so I do want to go back and experience it at night with more lights and everything. Yeah. Well, full disclosure for me, I've shown Kate in my gallery a few times, right. and I know her very well. Yeah. Um, how, 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 does, how, does this, how does this fit, for those who don't know her work, how does this fit kind of in her career? What's, what else is she up to? Well, uh, your point about not being allowed to participate is actually a point that I have with Kate's work as well. I mean, I love her work, but I've always thought, wow, that'd be great if I could do those things. It'd look really <laughs> fun, except they're only uh, accessible to women. Mm -hmm. um, the one thing about this piece that differs from her other work, or a lot of her other work anyway, is a lot of her other work involves the destruction of something. Right. Mm. And so uh, I don't believe that the house is being destroyed in any way whatsoever through this activity. So I think that's a bit of a mm -hmm. departure from what else she's done. That's interesting. And, and for me, this was one of these works where, you know, it, it's like meeting someone and falling in love. I have a huge art crush. I didn't care. I didn't care. I just wanted to love them. That's all I wanted to do. I thought this was, uh, this, this for me just was an incredibly visceral funny, strange, delightful, delightful yeah, piece. And we could have had every expert up here telling me it was no good and I would still want to marry it. <laughs> well, right. but I, I do have a question about that, though. So, so um, Ed, Ed knows Kate, so you know, there's, there's, right. you know, there's a history there. But for, for you, is that, that art crush, um, is there like an excitement of name recognition? Because it's like, like, for those who follow contemporary art, this is one of the bigger names in art prizes here. Right. Um, is, is, that, is that like... Changing your perception? Okay, Would it be as good well, if you were I'm discovering an unknown? I'm say that I didn't know who did it when I when I stumbled across. Well, that's it. I good. Didn't, I didn't right? look yeah. at the list, <laughs> and so um, I didn't do that sort of advanced work. So I think um, you know sometimes I think that does. Sometimes name recognition gives something a certain weight, and maybe you pause and think, oh, maybe I should give it a second thought. Um, or sometimes it maybe it gives you a kind of you give it you give it you're more generous with it than you actually should really be. I don't think so. I thought so. you were plenty generous. Falling in love with the artwork is the best way to stay. <laughs> so. I mean, people fall in love at art prayers all the time. It's just not always with the art. So I'm glad that happened. Yeah. 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 Uh, Crimson, full disclosure, were you a namesake well, with the red on the inside yeah. at all? No? Well, I identified with it. Yeah. But, I, but, I, but I do agree, you know, taking it in the next step or having the average person go in there and actually play on the swings would, would take it to a whole other level. But I understand yeah, about the aesthetics and the coloring and the dresses. I volunteer to be on the swing, but you have all to right. be aware. Yeah, that yeah. would be Great. Let's and go. I think, I think they would take you. All right. Uh, next up, let's look at two two finalists that are each.
each exploring or are in response to common themes of war and patriotism. Up first, the public's pick, Hometown Hero by Pamela Alderman, showing at the Amway Grand Plaza Hotel. Hometown Hero is a six by 24 foot acrylic on canvas painting uh, of a portion of the American flag upon which visitors are invited to commemorate the life of their hometown hero. While there is a portrait of a soldier also painted on the work, the artist says not all heroes wear a uniform or red cape, but describes them as ordinary people who display extraordinary commitment, love, and selflessness. Alongside Hometown Hero, we'll look at the juried pick entitled That Was Then by Prince Thomas, showing at the Grand Rapids Art Museum. The entry is comprised of video footage shot at a 4th of July fireworks display, synced to the actual audio recording, uh, reporting of the first hours of Operation Desert Storm on CNN, and takes the viewer through the initial bombing of Baghdad in 1991. That, Kevin, that, that was then, is that Kendall? Just to correct that. Oh, I, um, very so sorry st uh, starting out with Hometown Hero, um, this is a this is a tricky piece to talk about, and just to just to sort of clear the air, um, you know, we're critiquing artwork here tonight, and this artwork is about a true story, and it's yes. about um, sacrifice and service to our country in defense of our country, and mm -hmm. the ultimate sacrifice right. in defense of our country. Um, so I just want to make it really clear that uh, as we critique a, an artwork, uh, we're not critiquing its its subject. Right. We're not critiquing right. uh, the sacrifice that um, that those soldiers make. Right. Um, so I just want to make sure that that's clear. Um, but at the same time, you know, this is, this is an artwork that has become very popular in the hotel lobby. Uh, it's drawing a lot of response. Um, and there's been a lot of mixed opinions about it. I've had a lot of conversations um, with you guys about it and a lot of conversations mm -hmm. with other folks about it as well. Um, any, any first impressions about how to, how to approach this? You, you had a really... Well, I think we all really like how participatory it is. Yes. Right. Yes. And, and we yes. all wrote on the piece, and I, I mean, I love work like that, mm -hmm. that lets the audience come in and sort of leave their mark. Uh, we've shown some pieces in my gallery where a piece is supposed to change over time, and I'm always wondering, who is the audience for that? Does anybody ever come back and look at that piece mm -hmm. after it's been changed, and right. what, or is that really just for the artist? Um, I, I have one particular thing I wish the artist had done in this case. She has this great wall text about the young man who lost his life, and it's heartbreaking. I mean, he seems like the most beautiful person. And it was not just that he sacrificed the ultimate, he gave the ultimate sacrifice for his right. country. It was also, while he was there, he saw a need in the children of Iraq, and he started this campaign to send them shoes. Mm -hmm. That was so gorgeous. Yeah. yeah. I really wish the artist had brought a little bit of that into the painting as well. Right. Because it was a human side of him, and, you know, the flag behind him gave everybody plenty of room to write, but there was this part of the story that kind of completely got left out of the painting. I think. Yeah. yeah, it was like it was totally missing. As you were talking about, you know, the possibility of maybe shoes or something yeah, like that. Sure, yeah. You know, yeah. I mean, the, the aspect of participatory actually writing on the, on the flag, your hero. Um, I actually wrote art was my hero as well. But it's it, like it just sort of went flat in a lot of ways. Yeah, I think Sarah? for for me, I had a lot of conflict um, between the the notion of the the everyday person, so hometown hero, and having inviting people to write who their hero was, regardless of you know who they who they were, and then the 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 kind of stark, harder, patriotic symbolism, and those those two things just felt. I couldn't quite resolve them for myself in the piece, and it made it made it difficult for me really to get. I did. I actually didn't sign it because I I thought I don't want to write my grandmother, you know, on this on this piece, and then and then and then have you know two thousand other people just scrawl over it, you know, with their name or whoever their hero was, and all of that. And it just there was something about about it for me that that didn't that didn't quite resolve it and I, I feel badly saying that because I do think you know I think there are noble 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 intentions and a beautiful story there uh -huh. but as a participatory work it it I, I wonder what would it, what else could have been done in that vein if you were to start from scratch and not have it be a painting and a flag what would you do right. in order right. to make that to make that right. connection yeah. Yeah. So. And comparing, I, I was gonna say if it was one of my artists I, 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 I do this all the time for my artists and they resign it, but if it was one of my artists, I would have said, what you do participatory is you have people send shoes to some part of the world that's in conflict where people right. need something. Mm -hmm. Something Good to honor the memory story. of yeah. this brilliant young man. Yeah. So, right. yeah. so uh, hometown hero, quick. Yeah. Do you want to... Oh, no, yeah, no. We got that? We're good? Yeah, we're good oh, on sorry. that one. Okay. The video. All right, the video. Yeah, yes. that's the one. So, yeah, we, we, we paired this with That Was Then. 
um, a video piece. And um, I, I made that pairing because Shari Frilo, when she, she's our time-based juror, when she selected this piece, um, she said it made her think about how we narrativize war, which is to say we take true events and sort of build them into a more simplified story, which mm -hmm. seems to um, you know, re relate to Hometown Hero in a way. But um, this, this piece, it's very simple. There's really just two elements. Um, video of uh, you know, fireworks we've all seen, and then the um, audio of CNN at the, the Gulf War. What did you guys think? It made me look at the fireworks differently, totally. I mean, I love fireworks. Um, but it just sort of made me stop and really pause of that this was a real commentary that was happening at that moment during Gulf War. I'd love to know, really, they said it was 91, but when was the date for that? But it was just a, a little unsettling, very yeah. unsettling, yeah. you know? Yeah. I mean, I, I liked this piece quite a bit. I mean, I thought it was a, a really smart juxtaposition of things, and I loved the intimacy of putting the headphones on and watching it. Mm -hmm. I think there was something else I brought to it, and I don't know how much other people brought to this, but I remember that. And so I think the third media in that was my memory, mm -hmm. and yeah. that as I, was watching the, as I was watching the fireworks, I was trying to remember what the television set looked like in my apartment, because it was a, it was a stark moment. So I think that added another layer for me that made it that much richer, I think. All right, with that, the artist's own medium is your memories. That's a good point. I hadn't even thought that they were creating that in me. It could be uh, part of the work itself. Up next, let's look at two finalists, both com combining sculptural installations with live performance. First up, public vote finalist Symphony of Gestures by Sarah Dittrich and Benjamin Buchanan, showing at the Urban Institute for Contemporary Arts. The entry includes works in a playful and meditative atmosphere in which musicians in strenuous and pre precarious positions perform a composition created by the artist. Paired with the Symphony of Gestures is For the Toward. For the to Toward. That's very hard to say. <laughs> By the collaborative Boomerang, showing at Sight Lab's Rumsey Street project. In For the Toward. Am I, toward. Am I saying toward. it right? To toward. 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 Uh, toward. Yeah, that's, that's good. That pointed out the words to me. Uh, <laughs> performers can strain against crushing weights. They coax, ride, and hurl steel sculptures that are the immediate result of relentless labor. The performance balance on shaky weight and attempt to create a bearable environment in which to exhale and endeavor. Performance, sculpture, and installation combined to create these time-based works. Kevin. Yeah, so two, two very different performances, but both relying quite heavily on props um, and in installation elements as a, as a part of the performance. Um, starting with Symphony of Gestures, I know that we didn't get a chance to see the full performance right. today, but there's video and you talk to some of the artists. Um, you know, tell me about this, this space and these sort of unusual instruments. I think the fact that, that it's really hard in this kind of environment to have the musicians, the dancers doing a marathon for two weeks, I think it's really hard. If they could actually do smaller sets, I mean, I love the setting in this one, especially where the musicians were sitting in different positions and the juxtaposition of everything and working together was, was quite beautiful, really. But I would love to have actually heard them play. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I felt the same. I thought it was a very ambitious uh, setting with many different people and a lot of collaboration sort of uh, well before the installation and then through the installation. Yeah. It was a little intimidating. Uh, Benjamin invited people to play this one instrument after he masterfully played it, <laughs> yeah. making you think, I'm not about to go play that after you just did that. <laughs> but, um, I love that the public voted for this one, because if there was ever a beleaguered discipline, it is contemporary classical music. Yeah. And the fact <laughs> that the true. public actually made this one of the top 20 yeah. um, was actually just, you know, you know filled, filled, my, filled my heart with joy. Um, yeah. And uh, I think, if anything, you know, symphonies and orchestras should be listening and they should be getting out of those halls and into galleries and having <laughs> props and having people lie on the ground and play instruments and really make this a yeah, kind yeah. of spectator yeah, yeah, yeah. sport. Yeah, great. Well yeah. done, public. Way to go. Filling Sh uh, Sarah Schultz's heart with joy. How about the next one? Really quickly. <laughs> All right, over quickly. Um, uh, for the toward the boomerang performance, we saw this this afternoon. Um, there are some hammers swinging. There's steel. <laughs> this is a... It's it's a tense, tense Precarious. performance. Precarious. Oh, my goodness. And what we saw actually was just the solo dancer, right. but right. it was just beautiful. I mean, it was dealing with strength and the environment that he was not afraid to actually fling himself around on the asphalt yeah. and moving these weights, which at some point you thought he was actually going to 
crush himself, but yeah. it was just, it was very moving, especially in the environment. It was outdoors yeah. and not really getting distracted by anything in the outdoors, but just, it was just very powerful. Very yeah, powerful. Final thought on that Definitely one? one of my favorites. I mean, yeah. and also we were talking earlier, he pulled a lot of sort of uh, variations on performance art, or sort of the history of performance art into this. There yes. was endurance, there were... Uh, yes. uh, other components of it and I mean the, the tension of it the violence of it was really captivating yeah and so our all right sorry sorry I'd bell he <laughs> bell <laughs> <he's still laughs> you got bell you uh, mid word we, bell unfortunately we actually have run out of time so we weren't <laughs> able to get to movement or t-rex movement is the 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 gloves I'm so sorry I'm so sorry movement is a beautiful piece at the Grand Rapids Public Museum uh, gloves uh, in water they're inflated I'm so sorry anyhow I have to throw it Sue Sue can you help me out here can I'm, you take I'm it away I'm gonna try we'll have some final thoughts coming up we'll be right back We would like to thank our panelists for joining us tonight. And we are really just getting started for Art Prize Finale Week here on Wood TV 8. Our week of specials continues tomorrow night at 7 o'clock when we look at the best of Art Prize. And of course, it all comes down to one night with half a million dollars on the line. The Art Prize Awards are this Friday, and you can only watch them live right here on Wood TV 8. Thank you so much for joining us tonight on Why These Finalists. Have a good night.